Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming to the final panel of um, today's day, <laughs> the final panel of the summit as well. I'm Daniela Gilbert. I lead the Redefining Public Safety Initiative at the Vera Institute of Justice, and I'd like to welcome you to this panel, which is focused on restoration, uh, the ways that restored communities acknowledge and address the racial disparities impacting black communities, indigenous communities, and other communities of color. We're hoping to cover the policies, programs, and investments that are necessary to address racial inequities and heal communities of color. I'd like to first introduce our moderator, who will then, uh, all the panelists will introduce themselves following. Ed Chung is the VP of Initiatives at the Vera Institute of Justice and has two decades of legal and policymaking experience, including positions in the White House Domestic Policy Council and the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee. Prior to joining Vera, he was the Vice President of Criminal Justice Reform at the Center for American Progress and also worked on some of the Obama administration's signature priorities, including the My Brother's Keeper Initiative, the Task Force on 21st Century Policing, and ending the criminalization of poverty. Ed started his career as an assistant district attorney here in Manhattan, then as a federal prosecutor in the Justice Department Civil Rights Division. He received a BA from Boston College and a JD from the Georgetown University Law Center. Hey everyone. Oh, you don't need to applaud. No, 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 no need. <laughs> Uh, I, I get so awkward when somebody reads the bio because it's supposed to be like whatever, but um, I actually have, the folks on this panel actually have bios that, uh, that are uh, uh, worth applauding, and um, so I'm really privileged to uh, moderate this panel. Uh, we want to make this much more of a conversation style. You all come to this not only to receive information, but hopefully to participate, so I want you to get your questions ready. Uh, we're going to set the table for you all here by you helping for you all to get some just base information to ground us together, but then we just want to have a discussion. Um, and this, I think for, to wrap up a summit, um, this, is the, this is one of the best ways that I like to do it, uh, especially on such you know, a light topic like racial disparities <laughs> in, the, in the system and in public safety. Um, but I'm gonna just toss it to each of the panelists with an opening question, ask them to introduce themselves. Um, and then just with an opening question, because this is when we have your highest level of attention. So the opening question after you introduce yourself is, what is the, don't bury the lead. If you want, what is the one takeaway that you want this group to have after this session? And part B, you can answer it this way too. Is there a misconception about racial disparities either in the criminal legal system or in public safety that you want to dispel at this point. So we'll start to my immediate left with uh, Khalil Mohammed. Khalil, please. Thanks, Ed. Thanks everybody for, for coming and it's a pleasure to be here and I'm uh, honored to be here with my fellow panelists. I am Khalil Gibran Mohammed. I am professor of history, race and public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School, author of The Condemnation of Blackness and uh, as of late, the co-host of a podcast called Some of My Best Friends Are, uh, which uh, I try to hold court on some important themes that are resonant with today's conference. So Ed, you asked uh, a, a pretty direct question. Um, you know, from my vantage point as a historian, there's one significant period in recent American history, and by that I mean over the last hundred years, that bears a clear historical lesson, which is that attempting to lock up poor people who are engaging in a range of behavior, some of which are non-criminal, but there are criminalized, um, for the purposes of trying to survive in a capitalist society failed miserably. It was called the Prohibition Era. And what's remarkable about the Prohibition Era is if we imagine how hard a lift it is today in the federal government to get something like the George Floyd and Policing Act passed in the wake of what happened two, two years ago, imagine how much harder it is to get a constitutional amendment. They got not one constitutional amendment to save white America from itself. But two, the first one was the Volstead Act to criminalize to, uh, alcohol uh, distribution. The second was to repeal the Volstead Act. Um, so in that lesson, we learn a lot about the consciousness of a nation who recognizes the limits of the criminal legal system as an instrument to deliver well-being and safety. And yet, mysteriously, um, for much of the rest of the 20th century, even within our communities, and by that I mean 
most people in this room are people of color, uh, and if not proximate as allies of one kind or another, um, were kind of on the wrong side of this issue. Um, well through the 1990s, and I would argue even up until the election of President Barack Obama, there was significant ambivalence, uh, if not outright complicity, in holding the line on punitiveness as an appropriate response to, again, poverty, divestment, systemic and structural racism. So um, we certainly have a messaging problem, to be sure, uh, but we also have a consciousness problem. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, if we don't get the educational piece of this right in terms of what people who are most impacted by this system understand about how this system came to be, how it functions and what its limitations <coughs> are, we're gonna keep functioning at the margins. Because the one thing white people understand is political currency. You can't lock up an entire white community anywhere in this country, no matter what their social problems are. It's not gonna happen because the natural relationship between voters and the ability to say, listen, if this many people are high on heroin, meth, opioid, crack, you name it, committing acts of domestic violence, property crimes, you name it, then we have a social and structural problem that we need to address. And we just, we are bearing witness to that public health response uh, to this system. So I just want to keep reminding us that these are not abstractions in terms of what alternatives look like. They're already happening in the world. They already exist in the world and they are already old and enduring. So I don't know how we move our elected officials like Mayor Adams, um, unlike some of the others that we just heard from downstairs um, to fix it in this city, but he's not alone. Um, and of course at the state level, this problem um, is even more problematic, uh, but yes, we know what it looks like to decriminalize. We know what it looks like to invest in social policy in a public health infrastructure that would address the underlying needs of people when it comes to violence, crime, and poverty. Thanks, Cleo. Frankie? Uh, just real quickly to bio open. Yeah, if you could just, just, just give a little bit about yourself and yeah, please. Uh, well, uh, good afternoon or good morning, everyone. I'm Frankie Guzman. I'm an attorney at the National Center for Youth Law in Oakland. Um, I lead our youth justice policy work nationally, but I'm primarily focused in California and Colorado um, with the very generous and helpful support from the Public Welfare Foundation. So thank you very much. Uh, I, I'm just kind of joking, but serious. Um, you know, and I also just want to share the reason why I, get in, I got into this work is um, because, you know, as, as, a, as a young boy, my, um, I was three years old. My older brother, Freddie, was arrested for his, the crime of murder. He was 16, was uh, tried as an adult, and given a life sentence never to come home. And it, and it really you know, it broke my heart, my family, and, and set me on the wrong path before I myself became gang involved for all of my adolescent life. Um, and at 15, was arrested for armed robbery, given a 15 year sentence. Um, this was my first offense, given the maximum, and sent to youth prison, only to be made worse. And, and being in that system, you know, with 11,000 young people, in a system with design capacity for only 6,000. You know, it was a very toxic, dangerous, uh, uh, developmentally harmful environment. And so when I got out, I had way more challenges than I came in with, but I also recognized that most of the young people there were um, black, brown, you know, Latino and Native American, uh, poor white kids and, and Asian Pacific Islander kids. And um, most of them were bouncing off the walls, you know, looking for love and attention. And instead all we got was you know, I think neglect and abuse and, 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 and just hearing the judge at sentencing telling me, you know, if you're as good as people say you are, from, you know, with all community support, then you're going to go to youth prison. You're going to come back much improved. And I thought it was a sick joke once I got there, but it made me really angry. And, and you know, seeing most of my peers who got out of there die or, or go to prison for life, I felt very um, hopeless. But, I, you know, for me, my response was not to continue to go down the path most traveled, but instead to do the thing that no one else was doing and go to community college and I was just so stunned to find people that look like me in suits with degrees uh, welcoming me with not questions, criminogenic questions like, you know, what have you done and where are you from, you know, meaning what gang, but instead what do you want to do with your life and how can we help you to do it? And it was, it was, it, it made me afraid at first because, and uncomfortable because I had never been the object of somebody's like positive interest and investment. Um, but I leaned in and, and over time I was inspired to continue on. I went to UC Berkeley. I got an, uh, um, a BA in, in English, but I consider that to be white studies. Um, <laughs> you know. 
and, and, and at that time, you know, my mentality, very much from a gangbang culture, was know my enemy. And, and I wanted to understand why folks that were, you know, the school administrators that were locking, I mean, that were kicking us out of schools, and the doctors that were letting us die, and, and, and the police that, and judges that were locking us up uh, overwhelmingly. And over time, I just, you know, I learned to be an intermediary of sorts, a, a facilitator of conversation between the, the, those that have and those that have not. Uh, and went to UCLA Law School and focused on changing policies. And eventually, I, I've helped uh, write and pass in collaboration with the community uh, 23 different laws in California, including ending life without parole for, for juveniles and youth offender parole for people who have long uh, since been in prison um, for crimes they committed as youth. And one of those that came home in 2018 was my brother, Freddie. Um, after, yeah. After, after 33 years, um, you know, and so in a nutshell, like that is what, that's what I do and, and why I do it. Um, but not to the, to the question, um, you know, and, and it goes along with, with what I just described, which is I think a big misconception is that, you know, the criminal justice system is a black, white issue. And it is not. You know, you go to many counties in California and see not one black or white person in any facility. It'll all be native looking people, children. And. I will also say another misconception is that data means anything, and it doesn't. Data only means you know, what you're collecting, the, que the way you ask the question, and, and, and how you document the data. I, I work in Colorado, and, and police and prosecutors will tell you a lot of the white kids that we have in our system in numbers are actually Latino or Native kids, and we know it because we do not prosecute white kids here. Those six kids last year that we have as direct files were not white. They were Latino, all of them, and they say because um, they allow police to, to, to document their subjective belief about what the young person's race is because they believe to ask the young person is to be racially insensitive. And so to spare us that, that, that indignation, the, the cops just get to, you know, mark as white and it inflates white numbers and it deflates brown numbers. And so, you know, I'm, I'm just going to say that most of the time we're undercounted. Um, we're, it, you know, it's, it's a product of erasure. And I'll just say, you know, one last thing is the misconception that, you know, to be, uh, you know, Latino or Hispanic or, or, or Native American in, in Indian is confusing to many of us. Most of us don't know what to do with that. Um, it's a social construct that was created by the colonizer to erase us, right? Like folks that were American Indian here, um, we don't talk about, we don't, we don't, we don't acknowledge. Uh, we pretend that they only existed in the 1800s and before, but that is a part of the genocidal campaign that, uh, that is ongoing. And, and others of us, Mexicans and, and Puerto Ricans in particular, who are in fact U.S. Americans, were absorbed into this broader category of Hispanic or, or Latino, and thereby there's this, 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 this separation between one people. And now we don't know what to do with that. And so when I ask, like, you know, how do we identify? I just say, I'm indigenous, and I'm not, I don't identify with Latin. With, I'm not from l l any Latin country. I'm not from Spain. Um, I will not share my identity with my colonizer, um, but I do what I can to, to try to create unity with our native folks and anybody, I'm, I'm, I would imagine many of you in this room also have indigenous blood, and so I identify with, with our community in that way. Um, and so that would be the misconception, is really is, is like, you know, the, the, um, that, that genocide isn't still happening, that data means something, and it is a, a tool for, 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 for genocide and erasure, um, and the criminal justice system affects all of us, we just don't know it, and I think we need to push harder to make sure that we respect people's self-identification and, um, self-determination to be recognized and to be viewed as, as, as people. Thanks, Ricky. Please, uh, Jami. Hi, everybody. My name is Jami Hodge, um, and I think I'll sort of tie my bio into the first question, which is um, what I hope people will leave with. So um, I, my background, so I'm, I'm originally from Detroit. I grew up you know, in the city, uh, lower socioeconomic status, first in my family to go to college, first to go to law school. Um, and early in my career, had a mentor who suggested uh, going into the prosecutor's office in DC. Um, and in, in really, uh, with the idea, because by that point I already had cousins who were incarcerated as a young prosecutor, my own brother was incarcerated. Um, and it's only been in this past year that I recognize that I'm also a survivor of violence, which is a whole nother conversation we could, ha we could have separately and how many black people don't acknowledge that we are survivors of violence. Um, and so I went into the role very much with eyes open, um, knowing that the system causes a lot of harm, but thinking it was important that power holders 
be people who understand the harm the system causes and still believe prosecutors are some of the most powerful actors in the system. They can stop justice involvement at the point of arrest if they choose to. Um, and But what I'll say is, you know, I, I did that work um, and I do think made some difference, some. Um, but I also did a lot of harm because the tools that prosecutors are given essentially are to prosecute and punish. And so that's something I've had to reckon with in my own journey. But what it led me to was when I had a chance to leave, um, going to the Veer Institute to found and lead a program of shaping prosecution that worked with prosecutors elected on platforms of change. And for <coughs> me, that was an opportunity to do something instead of a case-by-case -case approach, but to impact jurisdictions by changing policy change. But what that work showed me in, in really the deep dive, and I'm so grateful just for this entire panel, but I have to acknowledge um, Khalil and the work that he does because I think the role of history and understanding these issues is the primary lens. Like if we don't understand that history and the intentionality behind these systems, we are missing the boat. So I just always will acknowledge and applaud that work. Um, and his work and so many others really influenced my own learning. Um, and so leaving, you know, what I, what I realized that Vera and that work still exists and it is important because too many people are ensnared in our system and we need power holders to hold that power differently. But what I tell you for me was a personal struggle is that um, in, in my struggle with criminal justice reform more broadly is that we're willing to try almost anything as long as it's low level nonviolent misdemeanor and criminal justice reform doesn't create the space to do something different for, with violence. And that's the issue, like that is what we really have to tackle. And so what brought me to the organization that I am extremely blessed and privileged and proud to lead, and I'm so grateful for so much of my team who's here, Equal Justice USA, is because I, it's an organization that starts with violence com and building and supporting community-based solutions to violence. And I just felt like, oh wow, um, you're starting with the hardest thing and you're starting outside of the system that isn't allowing us to do something different in this space. And so um, I shared my journey because part of what I hope people take away from this panel and from this conversation is the understanding, is, this, is that same journey I want others to take on. Take on. So um, I don't think it, it, that the answers to solving racial disparities in the system is to diversify the actors. We've done that. I don't think the answers are just to, um, you know, try these different policy changes. We, we need to do this, but hear me clearly, because people are impacted. But if we're trying to solve the problem, we've got to think bigger. We've got to have more vision. We've got to dream. And we've got to recognize that a system rooted in racial oppression that was established for the control and oppression of black people is always going to produce the racial disparities that we see. It shouldn't surprise us. We should expect it. So that means we need solutions that are rooted in something other than the control and oppression of marginalized communities. We need to build up and support the solutions that are rooted in love, rooted in healing, rooted in repair. And so what excites me about what we've seen in this gathering and over the last two days is being in a place where we're seeing so much of this in action. I have been so energized and given so much hope by the different conversations we've had over these last two days because these solutions are out here. But we, they're too far, too, far, too few and too far between and certainly not resourced enough. And so my hope is that we come out of this inspired to dream big, to build something else while we continue to tear down what's not working. Good morning, everyone. I'm Arva Rice, and I have the privilege of serving as president and CEO of the New York Urban League. Uh, the New York Urban League is one of 92 affiliates uh, who are part of the National Urban League, who's one of the co-sponsors of the event today. Our Urban League focuses on education, employment, and advocacy. And in this role, I was invited to do a couple of different things, working on a uh, commission with first uh, Police Commissioner Bratton, then most recently when Governor Cuomo was uh, wanting to reimagine um, the NYPD, myself, Jennifer Jones Austin of the Federation of Protestant Welfare Agencies, and Wes Moore, who at the time was at the Robin Hood Foundation, were asked to do a series of conversations with police officers, with community members, to talk about how to reimagine policing. It was the, some of the most difficult conversations that I've ever had, got cursed out in a church, um, got, uh, got, um, had some difficult conversations with various members of the NYPD, and as a, <clears throat> excuse me, as a reward for that work, 
<clears throat> excuse me, I was asked to join the Civilian Complaint Review Board. So uh, the Civilian Complaint Review Board, for uh, many of you may already know, is the New York City's largest oversight agency that looks at um, NYPD and those times and places when the, when the police um, it are engaged in uh, various um, issues having to do with excessive force, abuse of authority, offensive language, or discourteous um, uh, conduct. And so we are responsible for looking at those cases and making recommendations um, for discipline within the NYPD. And so that is some of the work that I am currently engaged in and why I was invited to be part of this incredible panel um, this afternoon. When I think about myths, um, I think the, the one that most of us are most familiar with is that whole idea notion that um, our communities are over-policed. Um, and the fact is, is that we're over-surveilled, right? So there's constantly people who are looking and checking on us. But when it comes to actual um, safety and protection, that uh, the fact is, is that we have the response that we get to calling 911 is less. The actual, the, the actual crimes that are, are solved is less. So I think that that's the, the most prevailing myth that most of the people around here and in this room already know about. I think when it comes specifically to the work of our of the Civilian Complaint Review Board, that a myth that, that exists is the fact that there's so many people who still don't know what we do. So we have uh, community meetings. Every month we have a meeting. Some are at our offices, others we go out into the community. And every time we're at a community meeting, we have somebody raise their hand and say, like, what is this again? How do, you, how do they talk to you? What, what are the things that are within your jurisdiction? So I think that that's one of the, the myths that, that, um, that you know, per perpetuate when it comes to the Civilian Complaint Review Board. But when I was asked this question, I really started to think about the myths that are on the other side. What are the myths that the NYPD walks around with every day, right? Like, what are the things that, that they tell themselves that might be true? And it made me think about two conversations specifically that, I ha that I've had. One was when I was doing that work with the governor's office, and one was um, as recently as yesterday. But I think that the, the, the first um, myth that um, the NYPD um, interacts with is, is when I was doing that work with the governor's office, I had a, a police officer say to me, you need to understand and recognize that we're never invited into the homes of our, uh, the people that we're policing for you know, Christmas dinner or for an anniversary party. We're always there at that point of, of contention and, and strife, right? And most of the time the police officers have is spent with other police officers. So the times that they interact with our communities are only at that time. And so what does that mean? And what does that mean for their interaction with me and with you? If the time, if they think that the, the times that define their interactions with the communities that they're policing are around those moments of, of strife. So that was one thing that, that kind of haunts me when I think about a myth within uh, that, that the police department is walking around with. The second is, as I mentioned, a conversation that I had more recently. The, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this as we, as we go forward, but there's the additional powers that have been given to, the, to our CCRB. And as a result of that, there's gonna be a higher level of accountability, including the repeal of, of 50A. And there, I'm sure there's people in this room who are responsible for doing that advocacy and that work and that push in order to repeal 50A. And it's huge, and it's huge for our communities. But for the police officers, they're seeing that as now they're going to have a possible mark that will keep them from getting a job later on when after they retire, right? So, so the, this effort, this energy, this push that these communities have put around accountability for, for a grouping of people feels like it's gonna limit their job opportunities. And so that's what they're walking around with. Barbara, could you just quickly just say what 50A is for those in, uh, of us who may not be familiar? So 50A is a, a, a state um, a law that um, uh, allows for there to be more transparency around police misconduct. And so that means that they can go log on to the CCRB website and actually look and see when police officers have had um, um, uh, accusations that were, that, were, that were put against them. And in the past, that was sealed. Nobody could ever see it. It was, it was completely sealed from, from public um, view. So being able to have that available for individuals is, is huge. Thank you. Um, just these takeaways are, are very, just you, you can ponder them, each one of them for a while. I mean, think bigger, dream bigger. Uh, the, the myths that uh, officers have about communities that they, um, they surveil, over surveil, um, the, the need to 
define this broadly and not just black white. It's not just a black white issue. And um, we know what this looks like. Over there. We know what this looks like um, in in different communities, in non-black Latino communities, in wealthy, uh, well-to-do, middle-class communities. Uh, you just recently wrote a book, or is it a report, or is it a report that's long enough to be a book? <laughs> so the National Academies just released a report that uh, I co-chair with Bruce Weston. Yeah. yeah, and in it, I mean, you 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 look at trends and you look at recent trends about the system and disparities in the system. Could you set the stage? I, I want to call you Professor Mohammed at this point because this is kind of the, the learning, the real learning that, that we would get sitting in your classroom, but what are some of the takeaways that, um, that the report provides and what has your research showed about disparities uh, over the last dozen, 20 years? So. Yeah, so first the report, Frankie and I were actually uh, committee members. And so my job as co-chair and Bruce are really to uh, bring together academics and practitioners uh, who review uh, the best and most recent research on a range of issues related to our charge. In this case, the National Academy's charge to us was to understand um, the causes uh, of racial inequalities in the criminal justice system uh, and what to do about them. Uh, so one of the, I think, important things, we do a, a number of things in the report, and Frankie, if, please jump in on this because it's important. Um, one of the things we do is we expand the definition of, of racial inequalities to be more than just racial disparity. Uh, because if we're stuck simply looking at whether or not there are um, differences, black, white, Latino, white, Latino, black, indigenous, white, you name it, um, then we miss the forest for the trees. Uh, so we need to understand that racial inequality uh, captures much more than simply the numbers represented by these various systems. Uh, the second thing we do is we understand that the history of colonization, of settler colonialism, of chattel slavery, and ongoing and continuing acts of racial domination that impact um, non-white people and forms of economic exploitation that impact everyone, including low-income white people, uh, are not the distant past. But in order to understand the relationship of how that history informs our present, we need to name it uh, in the report. And so rather than it being an abstraction, rather than it being a shout out, um, there is some attention in the early part of the report uh, to this issue. The third thing we do is we um, put a stake in the ground for the relationship between social policy and the criminal justice system in ways that generally do not happen um, in a report of this nature. If the primary focus of similar reports in the past has been various efforts at policing reform, the uh, reducing, or I should say, the growth in incarceration causes and consequences report that came out in 2014, these reports have been important, but they have narrowed our focus to what is happening in the system and what needs to happen to change things in the system. But the truth is that no aspect of anything we talked about today lives separate and apart from the larger social and structural climates that shape all of our lives. And so uh, we decided early on in this report to make a, a big deal about that there is no aspect of this criminal legal system that will solve for racial inequality, whether it's being driven by the system itself or whether it is driven by outside forces that doesn't turn on what we do in social policy. And by social policy, everything from housing to education to public health to mental health um, to early childhood education. We even talk about mortgage lending and discrimination in mortgage markets. We talk about the importance of greening and lighting. Uh, there are a range of possibilities that we want policymakers to make. Additionally, we talk about the fact that this system is dynamic and compounding, that Generally speaking, researchers are focused on a particular aspect, police researchers, corrections researchers, prosecutors, court research. But if we are to understand how this system actually functions, uh, then we need to look at all of those systems uh, in a dynamic process and recognize that like whack-a-mole, you know, any particular solution may not solve for the compounding effects that will occur down the road. And so big takeaway uh, to reduce racial inequality in American society, in which case the footprint of the criminal legal system is huge, is to do less criminal legal system. Right. <laughs> because 
uh, up till now, most of National Academy re reports started with the presumption that goodwill and good ideas would lead the criminal legal system to do a better job, better by whatever standard uh, we know has been the standard over the years. Uh, more efficiency, quote unquote, more fairness, um, more appropriate punitiveness for the bad people in our society, you name it. And it was a big deal, and frankly, back me up on this, but it was a big deal for us to use the language of shrinking this system um, as a primary focus across multiple axes uh, of engagement from less policing to less pretrial detention uh, to uh, lower uh, punishment for drug-related activity, uh, eliminate the death penalty, get rid of technical violations. Now I'm talking about all the stuff within the system because I've already talked a bit about the, the broader themes. Um, but less, less, less would equal more, more, more in terms of justice uh, that we would want to see delivered. And then finally, 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 I'm still trying to saw for a 350-page report, <laughs> is we spend a lot of time centering community at the heart of what we would expect to see in solving for problems along the, the range of, one, uh, empowering community to have more political efficacy. So in my previous comments, I talked about there are political, what I call governors, um, and that is not elected officials, but um, breaks on how much punitiveness can be directed towards white communities. Um, the same is not true for black and brown communities and indigenous communities, largely driven by demographics within the communities, but also racial gerrymandering, and also, of course, the fact that Every single criminal justice system we're talking about is state managed, meaning that state level politics, and there's no state in this country that is predominantly black or brown, not yet. So the degree to which we have to uh, empower communities to have more political efficacy in the things that they want to do goes hand in hand with everything from CVI, but also education, because we know that a community's voice can also be weaponized to unleash more punitiveness on that community. So we talk about heterogeneity, we talk about the need for more sophisticated survey tools to be able to point to what communities are actually asking for, rather than this kind of zero sum game of more or less policing. Frankie, if you wanna add anything about the, your participation in the report, but I also wanna, you know, and I also want to you know, direct you to some, not a, Saying something like a policy solution seems so small in this context. And so a solution or solutions or a way of approaching this issue outside of the system as we've been talking about, what's something that you can point to that uh, you really want people to emphasize, whether it's communities or whether it's policy, like elected policymakers and so forth? Sure. Um, you know, I'll just say when, when I first got out of law school, my Soros Justice Fellowship was to end direct file in California. And many people told me, like, you just spend your whole life doing this and you'll never accomplish it. And, and I kind of believed that because I didn't know anything. I didn't know what I didn't know. But what I did have was a strong organizing background, both as a college student, but also as a, as a gang involved youth. And I did not like associating with older white lawyers. They weren't warm to me or accepting. Um, you know, it's a brown kid, like, should we go away? We got this kind of a, a sentiment, which they didn't. Um, so I, I, you know, I just gravitated towards the hoods of, you know, throughout California. Again, black, brown, API communities all over the state and, and, and educated folks on law and policy. And my, my narratives were always more inclusive because I understood from, you know, as I mentioned before, this is not simply a black issue versus a white issue. This, even my own community would say like, well, we're not that effective. And I would show them or point out examples and over a conversation, they would change their mind, but it, it's just like we are conditioned to believe the stuff that we see during the first eight minutes of, of any news segment. And, and so what I would say is going into communities and, and talking to people and, and asking questions and listening more than we're talking to help understand what it is that, that folks sh should know. And so my, my approach has never been to convince people, but rather to understand what it is that they think and why. And only that way am I able to, to shift the, the, the narrative, and over time, it was really about self-determination, giving them the tools to do the things that I alone can never do. And, and I would say collectively in our statewide coalition in California, it's very diverse. There is no uh, you know, one group over the other. We're all equally contributing and affected, but it's, it's been very effective because I think everybody has a shared interest. And over time, we've been repealing and repealing 
And, and, and I'll just say another thing is, is you know, beyond the, the change in the narrative to be more inclusive, is also this idea that the only way to achieve true safety is through health. You cannot have public safety without public health because healthy communities do not hurt each other. Whether you're talking about young children who understand their identity, who understand culture, and the p people that police them who have control over their lives to be able to understand and appreciate them and see themselves in, in one another has been necessary. Um, and so, I, I'm not, you know, I know this question kind of shifted, but you know, for me, it's, 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 it's always been about trying to be on the ground with folks, understand from them, and speak to them uh, as opposed to at them. And, and otherwise, they just kind of check out. And if they don't see themselves as being affected by that problem, some of them get resentful because they do understand like we're affected too and no one's speaking to our issue or they just believe the lie that it, that it doesn't affect them and, and I think that we need to do better with our platforms to help people understand uh, that this does affect them and, and, and somebody said, you know, less, less criminal justice system. Stop deferring to the warden on issues of education or, you know, why do we defer unnecessarily, I think, to police when we have experts who are experts at medicine and, and youth development and, and public safety and public health we need, to, we need to do a better job of centering these folks as credible, as viable, uh, more so than the person who spent, you know, not to diss the military, but like they teach you one thing, but they don't teach you how to run an effective school or an effective hospital or, or an effective you know, society. So. Yeah, less criminal justice system, shrink the system, smaller, grow and invest on the outside uh, to address, address, I mean, we've talked about root causes in this, in this space for such a long time and the, the investments have not come with it. So, Jami, you talked about working outside. I mean, you worked in the system for a while. You worked to help shape the system and reform the system, but now you're working to uh, build uh, solutions. And, and I, some, my, my vocabulary is really failing me. Some, something besides solutions. If, if you want to shout it out, this is an interactive. Um, but uh, so solutions that that are working that are outside of the system, that community that is community built and led. Tell us a little bit more about that and some of the things that you really want to point out of what you see as, uh, you know, the things that need to be established, the, the, the core things that need to be established in your work. Um, I, I think that actually that gives me a good opportunity to, to address what I forgot to address the first round, which was the, the misconception um, that I think is the biggest problem for the general public. And, and I wanna be clear, it's not a misconception in this room, we are the choir, right? But the misconception that the general public has, which is that racial disparities exist in the system because black, brown, marginalized communities are more dangerous, they are the problem. And I think when we can flip that on its head and when we look at a situation, for instance, like Jordan Neely, and what happened to him on the New York City subway. And instead of, of looking at what he did, which was essentially shouting, asking for help, naming needs, uh, you know, thirst, hunger, um, being frustrated. When we can look at that situation and stop pointing at, well, he had a mental health issue. It was his thing. As our issue as a society and how we've failed, um, it was, um, D.A. Gonzalez, who said this, um, that, and it, I'll never forget this, when look, the shift for him was when he would look at a criminal history report as a lead prosecutor and not see the failures of the person, but the failures of the system. So we've seen you over and over and over. You've got 30 contacts with the system and we still have not gotten this right. It's not their failure, it's our failure. So if we can flip that on its head and we own, then I think that will, that will motivate us to, um, to understand that less pu less punishment is not the answer. And I do, I want to acknowledge, like, what a big deal it is that the National Academies of Science <laughs> would issue, an, a re issue a report. To me, that's a huge step in that direction. It is us owning that this is, we're making this worse. And this is not an individual issue. It's a societal issue. And we have to do something different. And so to your question about, you know, so what is working? To me, the things that give me the most hope are the things that we have the privilege to support in our organization, which are essentially going to the folks who have been most impacted by violence, who know most deeply what the problems are and who know and have been living the solutions. Communities have been taking care of themselves for a very long time, particularly marginalized communities. We know that from data that tells us when violent crime happens that 
50% aren't even reported. People are dealing with them in their own neighborhoods, um, but they're dealing with them, and I, and I think um, who really stood out to me in, in these last couple of days was um, Sam Vaughn, uh, if any folks were in the panel yesterday, um, talking about the specific work happening in Richmond around targeting shooters and, and the incredible results they've seen on bringing down shootings um, during the period of his work. But what stood out to me was essentially what was at the root of that work was love, was that they become the family because, though, and I, I talk about this anytime anybody will listen to me, and I think anyone who's been adjacent to the system agrees with this, there's no one who has caused harm who themselves weren't a victim first. This is why this idea of folks who are incarcerated, folks, it, this came up in the main panel with Eslot and others, that there isn't a separation. They were victims before they were offenders or people who caused harm. And even as it was Sarita describing how she testified before that legislature and what they throw up in her face as her conviction, no, they first should have seen her as a survivor of violence. But that's not the label they gave her. Now it will be, it was the label they gave the white woman who went in, you know, hold your head up, <laughs> you know, you'll, you'll, you can do this. So when we can give marginalized communities that same grace and the folks who are more willing to give that grace unfortunately are usually the folks who look like us you know we we are more willing to see the humanity see the potential and not just see the harm so um our work is really just going you know throughout the country work more most specifically in newark and baton rouge if you want some great examples of what's happening in newark and and i know some of this was touched on by mayor baraka but there's an incredible report sitting on that table over there that really documents the more than 20 community-based organizations who are leading the work in Newark. It is at a 60-year low in homicides right now. In a time in this country where almost every jurisdiction is experiencing an increase, that has come from sustained community engagement, going to the people who know the problems, empowering them, resourcing them, and giving them the capacity to do what they were already doing just underneath. So. Um, I would say see the report for some concrete examples, um, and I, I'll stop there. I've gone on too long. No, the EJUSA staff is prepared too with, with the reports. There it is. Hold, hold, hold it up high there. Hold it up high. It's over on. There it is. Yeah. Uh, one thing that one thing that you know resonates with what you're saying and what others have been saying as well is, um, you know, it's been going on for 15 years in New York Plus or however long in Richmond. It's been going. And we were talking earlier about the the um, the leash, for lack of a better word, that your that law enforcement is given, that police solutions are given. And somebody mentioned it's not even a leash; it's like whatever happens, you're all. It's always funded. It's always going up. It's always the same thing. And but for these types of other programs, for community-based, uh, community-led solutions, the it's such a sh you, come up with the uh, RCT immediately and come up with a study and show your results immediately or else the funding's gonna go away or else the political support's gonna go away. Um, really, really great. Arvi, you're, you're working in a, in a, in a subfield here in policing that, let's just say it's difficult and uh, let's just say it's, you have a lot going against you uh, or a lot that you're going up against. Um, talk to us about the things that you're looking at in your CCRB work that does, you know, kind of give you maybe hope or maybe some optimistic uh, look at um, shrinking the system or accountability and how to, how to keep uh, government actors in check? Well, I think that I'm hopeful because of the work that you're, that you're talking about, the work that you're describing. Uh, when I was asked to be part of that governor's um, uh, task force, we were specifically supposed to reimagine NYPD policing, and we refused to just look at that, right? So we started to talk about um, looking at decriminalization of poverty, looking at this history of, of, of um, policing, and making sure that that was part of the report and making sure that that was part of the conversation, because we know that as much as we can talk about accountability, and I can give specific examples of that and ways in which we can strengthen that, that we did have to take that comprehensive um, uh, perspective. And the fact is, is that you know the, the, the system that we have had 
that's oppressing black people was designed to, to do that. So the, the, the system is doing exactly what it was designed to do, right? So, uh, so we can talk about tinkering, but we need to also talk about reimagining. And that reimagining has to not only be a policing, but for all the other systems that contribute to the ways in which we are, um, we are oppressed as a, as a community. And so that was the reason why it was important for us to focus on all those perspectives. But when it comes to accountability, the, the Civilian Complaint Review Board has, has specific ways in which we think that we can be more effective. The fact is, is that, uh, that all the recommendations that we make around discipline are then given to the police commissioner, and the police commissioner ultimately decides whether to implement that discipline or not. So we have the police policing themselves. Right? And so to the degree to which we're only gonna have a, a certain level of accountability as long as that mechanism is in place. There are certain things that are specific that, that can strengthen our work as well. Uh, we have access to body-worn camera footage as a result of the great work of, uh, at that time, public uh, city council member, then public advocate, and now Attorney General Letitia James, who worked really hard in order to push for the body-worn camera footage. And so us being able to have access to it is incredible and um, is very helpful in our work, but being able to get that, uh, have more immediate access to that would be also be helpful to us um, as well. And then we have uh, the, our, their ceiling statutes that are also in place. So we're not able to, to look at specific cases and have to go to court in order to get a, the judge to agree to open up those, those, those ceiling statutes in order for us to be able to use that in our um, litigation work. And so that slows down the wheels of justice, even even the, the, the work that we can do is, is slowed down by that. So there are things that we know that we can do in order to make the CCRB more, most effective, but I think that it's important for every city to be able to have a CCRB at all, because I know that there's so many communities that don't have that. So to put, be able to put it into place and then be able to put in all the mechanisms in order that it's not only recommendations, but that they're, that they're uh, disciplined that can actually be impacted within those communities. Okay. Um, we started a little bit late, so I, but I want to make sure that I keep my promise to you all to make this a discussion. Um, so if you have a question, please raise your hand. Uh, there's a question right here uh, up front. And if you could speak loudly, because we are recording this, uh, and I'll try to come here, come to each, uh, uh, yeah, I'll be the, you know, okay. Um, uh, I'll play two roles here. Uh, so please, uh, if you want to ask a question. Hi, good afternoon. So um, I approach this work from... <laughs> not criminal justice mind, but an environmental justice mind. And uh, I appreciate the, uh, the, the information that you're sharing and uh, the efforts that you have taken to uh, you know, shift our minds in the way we think about criminal justice, but also attack those issues. Um, just as uh, you mentioned that um, basically we need to start shifting away from criminal justice just as uh, in environmental justice, you know, we're moving away from fossil fuels or we're moving into solar energy, we can do the same thing in the criminal justice space. But I think we need to be thinking bigger uh, in terms of uh, just policing and just, uh, 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 just, you know, like we need to be thinking bigger. So what I mean by that is that we need to be looking at what more root causes as to why things are happening. So. I work in the water uh, justice, and one of the things I've been studying is lead and how lead uh, actually affects the body and the brain, right? Uh, Mayor uh, Shokwe talked about um, how young people are committing crimes uh, in, uh, in Mississippi and Jackson um, on, at a higher rate than before. Um, if we look at what lead does to the brain and what uh, it does over time, um, we, have to, we have to know that there is an association to crime and violent crime, in fact. It's actually proven, there's data to prove that. Also in the foods that we're eating, right? We need to be looking at the processed foods and what they do to our bodies. Um, there have been countries that have been banning um, uh, foods um, that we accept here in America. I can tell you that the spinach that I used to eat before is not, it doesn't have the same nutrients as the spinach that I'm eating now. In fact, it's less, right? And so we have to get our uh, nutrients from the supplements that we're taking, but is everyone doing that? And are we looking at those sort of like, what lead, lead is doing to the body? Are we looking at what food does to the body as opposed to just looking at one sort of, you know, <laughs> coming from one um, angle. Thank you. Any, any response to, to that question? Uh, I'll just say uh, briefly that the, our report does point to the environmental racism that creates the toxic conditions and structural realities that can create an environment where crime is more likely to happen. 
Um, and we actually do point to the work of community gardens as part of a larger strategy um, of investing in communities, often led by um, community workers and or community leaders who are committed to uh, product, uh, better food and um, more green space in those communities. The only thing I'll add real quick is that also by doing less of the criminal legal response creates the room for more of everything else, you know? So with, when we're not spending the majority of our budgets, which is the case in most jurisdictions on police prosecution and prisons, then we can actually fix the lead pipes and do those things that need to be done. Hi, good afternoon, Rashid Thomas um, with the New York Urban League and a consultant. Um, what are your thoughts about um, states using prison labor? I mean, the, the short version of this, and I'm borrowing Ruth Gilmore, who wrote Golden Gulag, uh, is that, and maybe the numbers changed a little bit, but 92% of people experiencing incarceration are experiencing publicly funded, publicly run, publicly managed uh, punishment. So while it's important to recognize the perverse incentives uh, for CCC and other privately traded uh, companies that these days do a lot of work in the detention immigration system, um, it's a small piece of the puzzle of the prison industrial complex. Most of this, I mean, another way to reimagine re the question is to say, why do we continue to use the punishment system as a public works jobs program for overwhelmingly white people and to some degree working class black and Latino people um, who, who help to manage the problem of uh, organized austerity um, and divestment and the collateral consequences that come with that. So, First and foremost, thank you so much for the insightful dialogue. I recently read The Condemnation of Blackness, and it talked about the role of race in America and some of the outcomes and experiences we face today and how uh, things have built in that trajectory of focus, focusing on race as a tool to marginalize and criminalize people of color. I'm wondering your insights around race as a factor and class as a factor as it pertains to incarceration. Okay, Frankie, please. Yeah, yeah well, um, I'll just say, I think, you know, I started with this, I know that you, uh, you came late, but I think, you know, from, from the beginning, you know, race was constructed obviously for, for hierarchies and, and when you think about, um, you know, first of all, race didn't, didn't start at 1619 or even 1492. It started way before you know, the, 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 the campaigns against the Moors. It was racialized violence, uh, you know, Europeans against people in you know, the Middle East and in Africa. You could argue also that you know, ethnic violence was waged against the Irish Catholic you know, with the, uh, the, the Scots and you know, the, the, the Protestants and all that. And by the time they got to this, this continent, they had in some ways already very uh, advanced racial uh, hierarchies and racial violence, and and with you know with, with native folks, right? There was no place for them in order in order to create this myth, this narrative that this was a barren land, manifest destiny had to you know to, to have any any kind of seeming truth to it. They had to erase native folks, create Latinos, you know, create uh, African Americans, and, and and just divide everybody as much as possible, you know. And in the end, that is that is still true. Like we cannot have the people who are in power continue to have that power if, if we're all divided by race. And so I just think it, it, it is a, a, a both a product, a consequence, but it also the, 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 the thing that is necessary for settler colonialism to succeed. They needed to eradicate the, 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 the native folks for their land and, and, and exponentially grow black folks for, for the labor so that they can you know sip tea from the porch and, and watch the profits come in. Uh, and now it's the prison stuff. Um, you know, so I, I don't know what we do with that because we're so far gone and I think that it's such a complicated issue. How do you begin to undo the, the race and the consequence of being racist? Even thinking about the census and how I identify like not, 
not not being identified has a consequence, then we're undercounted. But you know, if I want to be identified as so-called Latino, I got to go through the white track, and I'm like, I refuse to do that shit. So I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm Native American, and you know, and and you know, maybe they have feelings about it, but I'm just like, there's nothing there for me. And so I just think this this idea of race is is, is just construed. It was, you know, it served a purpose. I think now it's just, it doesn't make sense for a lot of folks. Um, you know, we still don't capture a lot of folks that come from the Middle East. Some of them have to be white. We don't capture uh, a lot of folks, and you know, so I, I think. Um, Race is complicated, it doesn't make sense, and sometimes I just feel like, man, I don't even want to engage in that conversation because I'm not trying to make sense of some dumb idea that somebody else made that I don't really identify with. Another question. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> just uh, two things, both uh, Khalil and, and Arva, you've uh, alluded to two important studies, but I want you to lift up how we can get those studies, right? Uh, and, and, and Frankie, I want you to appreciate how much somebody like me, somebody who survived the streets of the Soprano State, to see somebody like you survive what you survive and then go through law school and be a change maker. So we're very proud of you. We really want to lift that up. We really want to lift that up. All right? and, and, and Arva, you know, uh, we just heard Mayor Baraka talk about his, his community based violence ecosystem, but we also rumbling like hell with our police. Mm -hmm. So they behave. And we have the only uh, civilian review board in the state of New Jersey, and we're fighting for it to have some of the teeth that you're talking about that you're dealing with on the inside. So I want to make sure that we connect so there's some places for the community engagement work that's very good that the CCRB does mm -hmm. in New York can help other fights for CCRB in places like Newark and, and other states. So I just wanted to lift all of you up in that way. I want to, uh, you know, close our conversation by asking one of the questions here about where we are as a country in this conversation. So, a lot of these conversations and knowledge has been in our communities for years, decades, and so forth. It's only come to the national level very recently. And, you know, let's just say it was like 10, 12 years ago that people started talking more about race in a, in a national conversation. Um, fast forward to, to our conversation now, and, you know, we talk about the recent incidents, you know, where, you know, there's a killing of a man on the subway, and there's a defense that comes with it uh, when, when people are pointing out the racial dynamics of that incident, or any incident across the country, whether it's a mass shooting in Texas, you know, where there are, there is what, Nazi emblems emblazoned on somebody's body who shot and killed, um, you know, eight, nine people, uh, a lot of them children, uh, and, there, and the, the conversation goes to, well, it's a false flag operation, and so, and so this is kind of the dynamic of the world that we're in. The, um, I don't use this term lightly, but it, the craziness that, that we're in when it comes to our national conversation on race. And so I want to close the conversation by asking each of you, as you do your work, how do you approach this in different settings? Uh, in, I mean, all right, I'm going to start with you, because you're sitting in a situation where you're talking about, you know, this is a conversation about race, disparities, inequality when it comes to policing. Mm -hmm. So how do you approach that conversation? Um, and I think these are some of the things that I want to, you know, learn from, and I think uh, folks in the audience will as well. If you don't mind, I want to pivot back to my other role, which is the CEO of the New York Urban League, right? So that, that's, what I, that's what I actually get a paycheck for. Um, <laughs> So uh, after George Floyd was co was uh, killed, I started to we were you know remember we were, we're um, deep in COVID, and so at the time I was you know trying to get back to work but still at home, and so I'd be sitting on my couch and my phone would ring and people would and I was getting phone calls. It was just like, hi, are you Arva Rice? Yes, I am. You're the head of the Urban League. Yeah, I heard you're black. Yes, I am. You work with black people. Yes, I do. Okay, so we want to build a partnership with you because you're black and you work with black people. Like literally, like just getting these random phone calls from people who are just like trying to connect with with something black, right? And so we started to do and have all these conversations with individuals, and I was thinking about it when you asked the question about the intersection of, of, um, of, um, of being black, race, and also of, of, of class. 
And I remember having a, a conversation with a particular sports franchise, which I, I won't mention, but they were in the Bronx and they were pinstripes. And, <laughs> and they called, and they'd been a long-term partner of ours, and they have actually done really good work with us. But their work was always about giving to the Urban League, so you could give scholarships or you could do this. It was always external. And so it was the first time that that, that that franchise looked around and said, wait a minute, most of the people who are working here don't look anything like our players, don't look anything even like the people who come to our, to our games. So what can we do in order to be more reflective of that? And my apologies for this long, long response. But so we started to do uh, a series of conversations with them and talking to them about disparities and, under, and underscoring it. And I remember, ha remembering, remember having to figure out a way in order to kind of bring down that initial kind of I'm not racist, right? So how, do you, how could I enter that conversation? And so I told them this one story, which I'll tell very quickly, and that is, um, so I live in Harlem, um, and I'm walking down the street towards my brownstone, and I look and I see somebody who's like laid out in front of the brownstone, and, the, and police officers are standing over him. And I'm, you know, so I'm looking like, oh no, what's going on? And I'm walking, I'm walking, and I looked and I noticed his first, his tennis shoes. And I was like, oh my gosh, my brother-in-law would, would love those tennis shoes. Like he's like, loves Michael Jordan, blah, blah, his Nikes, blah. And I'm walking, I'm walking, I'm like, wait a minute, that is my brother-in-law. <laughs> and so my brother-in-law is laid out in front of this brownstone and the police are standing over him and I walk up and my immediate response is, excuse me, what are you doing? That is my brother-in-law, right? And in that moment, it was, both, it was both race but also class, right? Because me as the black woman CEO of the Urban League who owned the brownstone came up on the police officers like, what are you doing, right? But, if it, but I could do that because of the place and space that I hold in the world, right? But then there's my, um, my brother-in-law who in that moment with his tennis shoes on and the way he was dressed looked like any other brother walking down the street, right? So the, the issues of race and class mm. are so connected, but being able to enter that conversation with that sports franchise team, recognizing I am privileged. I, you know, I have a college degree. I have uh, two, two uh, parents. I grew up in a two-parent household. I was the first person to go to college in my family, but still, I'm privileged, right? And so uh, being able to have that conversation, being honest about the place and space that I own in this world, but, always, but also knowing that if I wake up in the middle of the night in my sweats and go to the to go to the emergency room. I'm going to be needed, treated just like Shaquita and everybody else, right? So that's uh, that's part of the the ways in which I have to to um, uh, interact around race and uh, in class. Johnny, I think the answer is that um, the problems are so big; um, it, they're never going to be solved in silos. And so, um, another thing I love about our work, and you know, I keep I can't help it. Um, is one of our core values is transcending divides. And so we have intentional outreach work that is targeting conservatives, intentional outreach work targeting evangelicals. And in order to make the changes we need to see, we need, it, it, we, it can't just be the folks bearing the brunt of the problems who have to fix it, you know, it, it needs all of us. Um, and the thing is that work is working. I mean, wor that work grew out of, again, ending like our, our anti-death penalty work. So when you can stop the state violence, again, it creates the space to do something different. You don't end the death penalty in any state without a bipartisan um, bill. And so growing out of that work now, we are bringing our conservative friends along to embrace our fuller mission. And so we just took a group of conservatives down to Montgomery to experience the National Museum and Memorial. And that trip went I mean, we weren't sure what to expect, right? But the report back from the team is it went so much better than expected. We're excited about the opportunity. Like, at the end of the day, people are people, you know? And yeah, we've been, you know, we, we are all, one, we live in a world full of white supremacy, so we're all subject to that thinking. But we also know some folks are raised in certain families where they are taught certain things and until they uh, have the chance to learn something different, learn our history, go to a place where it can, they can see really clearly the direct link then at the end of the day, they're people, you know, and believe in, you know, just that we have more in common than what separates us. And to your question in the back, it, it's what gives me hope about like Reverend Barber's Poor People's Campaign, right? You know, like that is a, that is about class. It is not about, you know, we, it, it is an umbrella. We all need to be in this fight. Let's come together. And I think that's the kind of work it's gonna take. Fergie. Um, you know, I'll just say, you know, my, my approach to my work has definitely evolved and matured over the years, and, and you know, 
when I first started working on any direct file, I was very conscious that I was speaking to white men with a lot of power, many of them egotistical, many of them sociopaths, and, <laughs> and, and, and w was really c conscious <laughs> and also be my authentic self, um, but really not trying to trigger their ego or their emotion, right? So I even though I know I'm lying, I'm like, they lie every day, and I would start off with, you know, you're doing a good job, but you could do better. And, and try to find ways to help them do things that are, that are actually gonna have an impact. And, and over time, I just learned, some people are all about, you know, the pound of flesh. Some people are gonna be about the money, the, especially the legislature, you know, how much is this saving? And having different narratives for different people. You know, if you're talking to a libertarian, it's about like, you know, big government is abusing the little family, you know, individual families and, and, and what resonates. And over time, I, I'm, I'm just, you know, we, when I started, California was prostituting a thousand kids a year uh, as adults. And because of our collective reform work, we've been prosecuting less, it was like 58, 27, and 25 in the last three years for the whole state. And, and I've really been now focused on diversion and prevention and early intervention, but for, for that we need money. And, and then you always get the whole, you know, whether they say it or not, like this is charity for, for black and brown people. Like, um, and I say, do yourself a favor and, and, and don't make problems worse. You don't, we don't need those problems. And so I, I've been successful in moving budget, uh, budget bills uh, in the last few years that I worked on them, we moved almost $60 million for pre-arrest diversion programs in California, and I wrote in the legislation for non-government, non-law enforcement entities. This can only go to CBOs, and, and, and they must be in the communities where, where, where this stuff is happening, so only communities with have above average rates of incarceration or racial disparities can get this money, and it's for, for all sorts, you know, culturally rooted, pro-social, academic, uh, labor, apprenticeships, things like that. And, 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 and using the data to show this is a good investment. For every $1 you invest, you yield X amount, and it, and it changes. But that's the stuff that to some people who don't care about racial justice care about. Some people don't care about science. They care about the bottom line. And so just being okay with that, because I can't go into a community of color and bring up the money argument. I mean, it's like, who fucking cares about money? Well, some people do, and I need to be equipped with that stuff. And, and they move. And to date, we, we, we've had uh, two three-year cohorts come through this. We've served more than 15,000 diverted youth. We have a 70% 70, 70 success rate with only 68% that were rearrested after being diverted in these programs. And, and again, it's about self-determination, letting these communities choose for themselves who they want to serve, how they're going to serve, and, and giving them the money and staying out of the way and not calling it charity. It ain't fucking charity. It's like us doing ourselves a favor and not creating more problems by letting police and police will also say, I don't want to be taking this kid to probation. They do nothing. It's a revolving door. And if given the opportunity or, or, or that choice, I would take them somewhere else. And they do. So, I mean, that's just, I'll just say, you know, that's how I approach it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I love the, you know, being able to have different conversations with different people, maintain your authentic self. Um, really, really appreciate that. Uh, professor, you have the last word. I was looking for this, uh, this quote, uh, and I just about got to it, so I'll share it in just a moment. Um, you know, I've been doing uh, some version of this uh, performance uh, <laughs> for, for about 25 years. Um, I've sort of been studying the criminal justice system since the late 1990s as a graduate student. And, uh, and a lot has changed, a tremendous amount has changed. I mean, we use the word race here a lot when we really mean racism. Uh, and so race has been a euphemism, which, you know, for me, 15 years ago, often really was coded as the problem of black pathology or brown pathology, uh, the problem of what those people are doing as opposed to systems and structures. Uh, so I'm always conscious today to be clear, I mean, I wrote a book with the subtitle Race Crime in the Making of Modern Urban America, not Racism Crime in the Making. I wish I knew better then, I know better now. So language has gotten uh, more precise in naming the, the problem. The public health community is really good at this. Uh, race isn't what leads to premature death, racism is, um, in terms of access, in terms of the food desert, you name it, to come back to your earlier point. I also want to say, you know, over the last 15 years, particularly, and not quite, but since I've been in this city, um, you know, first at the Schomburg and, and then continuing in my, my work here, a lot of nonprofit work that, that is headquartered here in the city, um, I remember coming to John Jay for the first time, not, not actually as the first time to visit, but the first time to teach a class. I taught on one particular day, I taught in an undergraduate class and I taught in a graduate class. 
and both classes happened to be uh, led by faculty who were teaching mostly police officers. Um, so the student population uh, in those classrooms was overwhelmingly cops. I gave basically the same mini lecture on condemnation of blackness. Um, and in both classes, uh, one undergrad, one graduate class, um, the overwhelming population of police officers of color were very defensive that they were, I mean, and I'm gonna quote basically one of them, but the spirit and the tone was similar everywhere. You know, they had joined the NYPD to clean up their communities and catch the perps in their community. And it struck me as very powerful because here in the context of what, you know, was about education and professionalization for these particular police officers, they had a very simplistic, crass notion of how the world works. They're good people and they're bad people, and my job is to catch the bad guys because that's how I'm gonna make my community better. And so nothing, and this was after I had already spoken. So, <laughs> so <laughs> it, 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 uh, it, didn't, it did not sink in. Uh, and I worry, I worry that um, the time from then till now has seen, a, a, in some ways, a lot of change, but not enough. And I think that we have to be even more clear in conversations. I mean, I, I appreciate Jami talking about reaching out to white communities of conservatives and evangelicals, but I think we, we don't focus enough in our own families. Like, you know, a lot of white people had to count for the Trumpers in their own family. I had one in mine, a black woman who, who was a Trumper. Um, but I don't think we are spending enough time talking to our own uh, relatives about why more policing is not gonna save us in this system, in spite of the carjackings and the subways, and you name it, no matter where you are in this country. Um, because this system doesn't work in today's age. It, it worked 50 years ago. It doesn't work today without black and brown jailers. It just doesn't work. And you're gonna see even more of them. I mean, I'm a free, tenured, privileged professor, so I can say what I wanna say, but you know, my guess is that aside from the 30% of black and brown New Yorkers who are actually punitive and law and order types, which is real, um, the silent majority of black voters who were swayed by Eric Adams' tough on crime messaging um, maps onto a white population of, of actual New Yorkers who would want an Eric Adams to follow a Bill de Blasio to make possible the kind of veneer of non-racist police action tough on crime. Like, we gotta be, we have to keep up with these people because the presentation of, of, of black and brown people standing as the gatekeepers and guardians of racial capitalism is gonna become even more significant in the, in the years, not decades, in the years to come. It, Trump got 50% more black voters uh, in 2020 than he got in 2016, particularly black men. Like, we can't forget this. Um, and the organizing, I mean, the Herschel Walker uh, thing is not like a fucking joke. Like, they will reach down to the lowest depths of, of the abyss. And, and the thing is, if, if, if the people in this room aren't having those conversations with your cousin in Athens, Georgia, um, about what is happening, then we have to bear some responsibility for you know, having this conversation amongst ourselves and writing our papers and being on the National Academies and this and that, that when that's where the front line of the work is. It really is about the education that is required to get people to understand how this works. So I'm gonna close with this quote from the great uh, literary critic and um, novelist. His name is Albert Murray. And Albert Murray wrote a book in 1970 uh, called uh, The Omni-Americans simple thesis that, that because of the unique conditions of black life in America, they were the most American of all. And, and Nicole Hannah-Jones makes a similar argument in the 1619 Project. He says, 
The social science statistical survey is the most elaborate fraud in modern times. African Americans should never forget that the group in power is always likely to use every means at its disposal to create the impression that it deserves to be where it is. And it is not above suggesting that those who have been excluded have only themselves to blame. So uh, we have the voices, we have the work, uh, everything Frankie has shared is just uh, spectacular. Um, we've got to organize in our own families, in our own communities. We have to share the good news of what's happening in Newark um, because that's the difference between saving lives and building a better future for all of us and taking some personal pride in our own individual agency because that's not going to get us there. Please join me in thanking these panelists.